Shalom. My name is Adam, and I welcome you to the parable of the vineyard. Every day, Yahuwah is waking up a remnant, a group of people who are coming out of deceptions, realizing our walk is to consist of faith and obedience to His righteous commands. Each week, we read through and examine a portion of the Torah, allowing the Spirit of the Most High to guide, teach, and open our eyes and ears to the wondrous matters out of His law. Join us as we seek to be refined by His Word, preparing ourselves for the return of our King of Kings, being faithful and obedient, walking in His way, truth, and life. Hey, Shabbat Shalom. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube live stream of the Torah portion reading. My name is Adam, your host, and this is week 49, Key to Zay, which is uh, Deuteronomy, was it 21, 10 through 25? I think I wrote 9, but it should be 25, 19 there, so I'm going to have to fix that over there. Any case, it is through 25, 19, so my graphic is wrong right here. Any case, uh, let's get started with some prayer. Heavenly Father, Yahweh Most High, we come before you, we bless you, thank you for Messiah Yahusha, your word, which is a lamp to our feet in these dark days, Father, thank you for salvation, thank you for opening our eyes to, well, the truth of your Torah, that it has not been done away with, Father, and the majesty of walking in it, please help guide us to walk in it, Father, open our eyes and ears continually that we may be hearers and doers of your word, Father, and be found faithful and obedient when Messiah Yahushua returns. Bless you. Shabbat Shalom. Amen. So, uh, I want to just mention, you know, I'm a student of the Torah. I am learning the Torah myself, coming back to it. And so, I offer these studies as, um, as if we were in my living room in reading through it and kind of just giving you my notes through the weeks, through the years uh, as we go through these because some of these notes are, you know, a couple years old and then I just kind of as, you know, I go through it, I refresh them and add new things or take away maybe some things that I'm like, I don't know if I am really feel the same way this year as I did two years ago, you know. Um, so I basically what I'm saying is I invite you to study the Torah alongside me um, together. We can be study buddies and we can learn this Torah and walk in it and do it, and help others see it too. So, let's study together. So with that being said, I'm going to wake you all up a little bit. Alright, now that you're awake, let's get into it. So here we are uh, reading from the Sefer version. However, uh, this week we'll definitely be reading quite a bit in the Targums because there's some interesting passages in uh, this Torah portion. And uh, some of the things are you know, awesome and easy to understand. Some of them are kind of hard to understand. You're like, oh, okay. Uh, so let's go through it. And not to say that I have all the answers. Um, I'm still seeking myself and seeking to be refined. Um, but let's share, let's go over this together. So Deuteronomy 21.10, when you go forth to war against your enemies and Yahweh Lahaika has delivered them into your hands and you have taken them captive and you see among the captives a beautiful woman and have a desire unto her that you would have her to be your woman, then you shall bring her home to your house and she shall shave her head and pare her nails and she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her uh, which, by the way, the reason that what this is is um, it was pretty common practice back in the day when um, a city was conquered and the males were put to the sword or, um, you know, the women, they would put on their nicest attire to be attractive because they didn't want to just be left in the city. Um, that would have been that would have meant death for them. So they would want to be taken, uh, taken in by somebody. And so they put on their basically their 
uh, what people today call their Sunday best, but we'll call it their Shabbat best, and uh, we're picked up. And so anyways, uh, she'll put off, she'll put the raiment of her captivity from off her and she'll remain in your house and bewail her father and her mother a full month. And after that, you shall go into her and be her man and she shall be your woman. Uh, let's pause there real quickly. Um, you know, let's, let's look at a few things here when it says that you have a desire under her. This kind of makes it seem like, like you're lusting after her. If you see this woman, you're like, I gotta have her, you know, it's actually not really kind of really what it's saying here. Um, there is a different type of word for desire and lust um hashak des desires as love right it's to be loved to attach for to long for this kind of denotes something a, a little more uh harm not harmless but not the word i'm looking for pure pure intentions how about that uh so this phrase here have a desire of her is a little more pure intention this isn't just like hey she looks good you know i want to have some of that um that's not really kind of what it's saying because he could have used the Hebrew word here to Ava, which is a different type of desire, which is more like um, a lust, appetite, covetousness in a bad sense, object of desire. So something that would maybe not be as uh, harmless in intentions. So any case, uh, so let's, uh, let's keep going here. So um, if verse 14, it shall be, if you have no delight in her, then you shall let her go whether she will, but you shall not sell her at all for money. You shall not make merchandise of her because you have humbled her. Uh, so let's pause there. I actually want to read a little bit. Of, actually, we're going to read all the Targums here in a little bit. Chapter 21 is very short. So there's some interesting things to uh, put some puzzle pieces together as to what's exactly going on here. Why does she have to wait a month before, you know, he basically makes her his wife, goes in unto her. Um, what's going on with that? But we'll find out here shortly. Um, if a man have two women or two wives, one beloved and another hated, then he is committing sin. No, it doesn't say that. If a man have two women, one beloved and another hated, they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated. And if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then it shall be that when he makes his son to inherit all that he has, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. So uh, I, I apologize. I made a little joke here at the beginning. Um, I, I shouldn't I shouldn't have done that. Um, forgive me. But this is a very touchy subject in the Torah community. There's, uh, there's well, there's kind of three sides to this. One side is like um, polygyny, which is a man taking multiple wives. One side is like, absolutely atrocious no way um they're sinful um then you bring up like abraham you know and of course david and gideon all people that were deemed righteous jacob you know and they're like well you know they weren't sinful but yah allowed them to do their thing you know and and he didn't want it that way but he allowed it well the one thing i love about torah it's black and white Either something is sin or it's not. So either polygyny is sin or it's not. Personally, I have no desire for it. Personally, I don't want multiple wives. Uh, I think having one wife in, in this world, uh, especially in the upbringings we've had, um, can is, is enough challenge. Uh, it's enough joy and enough challenge at the same time. Um, I don't promote polygyny. But over the years, people have asked me to denounce it and to speak, speak against it. And that's something I'm not willing to do. Um, and this may this may upset many of you, especially women. I've had many women email me and say polygyny is degrading and it's horrific and you know um, it's it's a sin. And Yah just allowed men to be sinful, like Abraham and in and, and Isaac or Abraham and Jacob and David. But that's not what the scriptures say. Um, it said that, uh, you know, let's take David for example. The scripture said that, um, the scripture says that he was uh, perfect in all his ways except for the incident with Bathsheba. And David had many wives. So if, if that was a sin, it would have been David was perfect in all his ways except for the incident with Bathsheba and his multiple wives. It didn't say that. Uh, it also said that uh, Abraham and Jacob were 
uh, not sinful men. They did not sin against Yah. Um, here's an interesting passage from Prayer of Manasseh one eight. Therefore you, O Yahweh Elohim of the righteous, has not appointed repentance for the righteous, for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who did not sin against you, but you have appointed repentance for me, who am a sinner. So Abraham and Jacob, especially Jacob, had four wives at the same time, was not a sinner, but did not sin against Yah. So here's my point. I'm not here sitting here pitching polygyny. I'm not, because I just, I'm not a big fan of it. I'm, I'm just not. Um, and even though, even even uh, when we do see the scriptures, Abraham, um, when he had Sarah and Hagar, that turned out to be a mess. And, you know, <laughs> it didn't work out that well. Jacob, and of course now, he married sisters, which later on in the Torah, I think because of that situation, is like, don't marry sisters. Because it turned out really bad. And Leah ended up being hated. I mean, it straight up says, the scripture says that Jacob hated her. Like, if... <sighs> What kind of life was that uh, for Leah if she was hated? I mean, I don't know. We don't get all the details, but I'm not a big fan of it personally, and I'm not promoting it here, but we're either going to stand for Torah or we're not. And here's a Torah, and the reason I bring this up is here's a commandment. It doesn't. It says, if a man have two wives, one beloved and one hated, even acknowledges that if you have two, one would probably be more loved than the other. That's rough. That's a rough life. I mean, personally, I'm just saying I, I couldn't imagine being a second husband and being hated like ouch so but we can't let our heart get in the way of what's right or what's wrong so if we're going to turn around and say polygyny is a sin well we're going against torah and it's look at this world that we live we've grown up in we're, we're growing up in a world that calls polygyny disgusting despicable but homosexuality a-okay, transgenderism, A-okay. That's love, love is love, let him alone. Don't be a polygynist though, that's disgusting. That's the world we grew up in that belittles and demeans everything in the Torah. It flips it upside down. I mean, it's all over, all, I mean, look at the, the hand, uh, Handmaid's Tale. I mean, it just makes anything biblical that people would stand for just flipped upside down. So what am I saying? Am I saying go out and have multiple wives? No, I'm not saying that. Because, I mean, look at David. His his life was a wreck. Um, look at Jacob. It was just constant bickering uh, with the wives, multiple wives. So, but what am I saying is I will not call it a sin and I won't condemn polygyny. I won't do it. Won't do it. I'd be the biggest hypocrite on the earth. If I say I'm going to stand for Torah and for what it says, I'd be a huge hypocrite by saying polygyny is a sin. That's not what the Torah says. It says right here, if a man has two women, it would. if it was a sin, it would say, if a man have two women, one beloved, one hated, what are you doing? You're sinful. You can't have two wives. It doesn't say that, though. It doesn't say it. If it said it, then I'd stand for it. I'd be like, hey, it's a sin. That's what it says. But it doesn't say that. And I know I'm probably going to get emails and Adam, well, you know, Yah says he, he made a male and female at the beginning and um, and uh, he made one man and one woman. I get it. Torah also says this. And this whole, we're all the seed of Abraham. And if he was a sinful man living in sin by taking, you know, two wives, he eventually had three wives, but not all at the same time. What are we even talking about? This is, this whole thing is built off of a sinful man? The scriptures tell me that Abraham was faithful in all his house and kept all his statutes, all his laws. Uh, where is it? Um, Gen 26, 5. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So if it was unlawful for him uh, for someone to have two wives, then it would have said something. He kept them all except for the multiple wives thing. I'm sorry to spend so much time on this, but this has become this has become a problem in the community. Um, people are asking me to denounce this and condemn it and kick people out, you know, of uh, fellowship for for doing for um, for people that. Don't call this a sin, you know? So, anyways, let's keep going. All right. Now, another 
Another tough one. <laughs> if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto him, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. Now listen, this is, we're not talking about a 10-year-old boy here. Uh, he is a glutton and a drunkard, so we're talking about probably the equivalent of a you know young man in his in his late teens or early twenties, right? And all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he dies, so that you shall put away evil from among you, and all Yashrael shall hear and fear. So this isn't talking about your five year old that you know is continuing to to like test the fences, right? And like go to bed. No, I'm not going to go to bed. It's time to go to bed. I don't want to go to bed. Okay, let's say we're going to the gate and we're going to stone you. That's not what it's talking about. This is talking about a grown, uh, a grown man that is a that is a glutton and a drunkard, right? But uh, you know, let's actually go to the Targums and let's read a little bit about this. Um, I will go back to the uh, captivity one. Here, if a man have a, so this is the Aramaic Targums, if a man has a son depraved and rebellious who will not obey the word of his father or his mother and who, when they reprove him, and we'll talk a little bit about this because this is Torah, right? To, to correct your child, to chasten them, to train them. He will not receive admonition from them. His father his mother, and his mother shall take him and bring him before the sages of the city at the door of the court of justice in that place and say to the sages of the city, we had transgressed the decree of the word of Yahuwah. Therefore was this was born to us this son who is presumptuous and disorderly. He will not hear our word, but is a glutton and a drunkard. And it shall be, now here's the Targum. There's a little more here. And it shall be that if he is brought to fear and receive instruction, and beg that his life may be spared, you shall let him live. But if you refuse and continue rebellious, then all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he dies. So, you sh so shall you put away the evil doer from among you, and all Israel will hear and be afraid. So there's a little more uh, here in the Targums. And as I've said before, the Targums is a great resource to study. I'm not saying that this uh, oh, you know, supersedes what we read in the Masoretic, you know, the KJV, the Sefer, the Hallelujah Scriptures, um, whatever. I'm not saying this supersedes it, but I think this is good to study alongside and maybe get a full depth of what actually is going on here. So, uh, a little more to say. So, you know, are we doing this today? Well, no. I mean, first of all, we're not you know, we're not in the land. Um, we do even see Messiah Yahusha was like, hey, uh, to the adulterous woman, hey, go and sin no more. Now, it is interesting, though. Um, I think, you know, they, they the Pharisees tried to tempt him because they didn't follow Torah. When a, when a, a man and a woman were caught in adultery, the man and the woman were to be brought to the gate or uh, to the judges, and both were supposed to be there at the same time. The man wasn't there. It was just the woman. So they wanted, and that's why that scripture says they brought her asking him, tempting him, right, that they might have an opportunity to accuse him. Uh, well, because if Messiah Yahushua would have condemned her to death via stoning, then he would have actually been in transgression because the man wasn't there as well. So we're going off on a, a tangent here. But uh, let's go back now to this woman in captivity. Uh, it just the Targums give here just a little more clarity. When you go out to war against your enemies, and Yahweh Elohim shall deliver them into your hands, and you take some of them captive, if you see in the captivity a woman of fair countenance, and you approve of her, and would take her to you to wife, then shall you take her into your house, and let her cut off the hair of her head, pare her nails, and put off the dress of her captivity, and, dipping herself, become a proselyte in the house. Now, isn't that interesting? Dipping herself? This, is, this would be like, like a baptism, right? Dipping yourself, become a proselyte in your house. Proselyte is a convert, convert to the way, and weep on account of the idols of the house of her father and her mother. So it's a little different reason for weeping her for her father and mother. And you shall wait three months. So the Targum says three months, which the reason why here kind of makes a little more sense of why you would actually have to wait a month. And you shall wait three months to know whether she be with child. And afterwards, you may go into her, endow her, and make, your, make her your wife. So, that's kind of interesting, and that makes a little more sense to me. Um, you know, last year, 
what I was thinking or understood and, and was that, you know, and this still may be, may be true. And part of it, um, is that when you brought her, you shave her head and pair her nails and put off her beautiful garments and wait a month. And I guess it's like, Hey, do you still feel the same way about th- this woman? You know, you saw her in her best attire, beautiful hair. She presented herself and you're like, somebody picked me up and you picked her up. Now you've totally humbled her shaved head. Her nails are paired. Uh, her beautiful raiments off her. Hey, wait 30 days. Cool off a little bit and see how you feel before you actually marry her. So that's still, I think, uh, I still think is part of it, the 30-day cooling off period, if you will. Um, but waiting three months to make sure that she wasn't pregnant before, I think is a really good idea too. So something, just uh, some things to, to discuss there. Um all right, so Deuteronomy twenty one twenty two, um, and if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he, and he be put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but you shall in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is a curse of Elohim, that in your land, your that your land may bound up the that your man, <laughs> that your land. Be not defiled, which Yahweh Lahaika gives you for an inheritance. And we saw this that, hey, this is one of the Torah laws that the the Pharisees actually kept with Messiah Yahusha, is that before the sun set, they took him down off of the the cross or stake or tree. Um because they didn't want to transgress transgress this Torah, right? So they were partial in the Torah. They kept some, but the others they, you know, had man made laws in, in favor of the true Torah, uh, things like that. So anyways. Okay, so let's move on to chapter 22. Various laws. You shall not see your brother's ox or his sheep go astray and hide yourself from them. You shall in any case bring them back again to your brother. This is, again, so what we what I've said many times is we're going through the Torah with a mindset of what can we keep? Not a mindset of, ah, you can't keep it all, so just don't do any of it. Right, which 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 most of you came out of, most of us came out of. Now I think we're in a mindset of, okay, we can't keep all of it. Fine. What can we keep? This is a great uh, example here. Um, this is kind of a heart condition, right? You shall not see your your brother's ox or a sheep go astray and hide yourself from them. You shall, in any case, bring them again to your brother. So even for those of you that live in the city, like, hey, your neighbor's dog got out. You're not going to like look through the blinds and be like, oh, neighbor's dog is out again. Flip. No. <laughs> You're going to say, oh, the neighbor's dog got out again. Oh, let me go help. <laughs> hey, Cujo got out again. Oh, thank you. That's Torah. Right, some of this, some of this stuff in the Torah, we most of us would naturally do anyways. That's why Paul says those who uh, keep the law are as a law unto themselves. Right, those that don't know the law but keep the law is a it's a law unto themselves, something like that. Because some of us, you know, he's just put those statutes in our heart. Some of them we got to learn. Some of them we got to grow in. Some of them are just kind of natural. But for some of us. This may not have been natural. Some of us may have been like, yeah, bah humbug. You go get your dog yourself. I'm tired. You, uh, It's your fault because you can't. You, that fence is broken. You haven't fixed that fence. Well, maybe go fix the fence for them. And if your brother be not nigh unto you, or if you know him not, then you shall bring it unto your own house, and it shall be with you until your brother seek after it, and you shall restore it again to him. So those of you in the country and, you know, someone's ox, make, make sure that you take note of which ox that is and put it in and... Uh, wait until, you know, the, the owner comes looking for it. Again, modern day context, you live in the city, hey, you find a stray dog and running across the street, tearing through your street, you're like, hey, come here, Cujo. Here, uh, come come, uh, come have a treat. Here, come on into my house. Go ahead and hang out in the backyard. I'll feed you. I'll give you some water. Uh, let me go, uh, let me call a- animal control and be like, hey, um, we got a dog. Uh, there's no tag here, but this is the, this is the description, blah, 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 blah. Um, or those of you that are on Facebook, I don't, I don't, uh, recommend it, but they have the lost and found dogs in your city. Be like, Brr, I found Cujo here or whatever his name, his or her name is. And just make the effort to restore the animal back to its owner. Um, this is Torah. Just straight up is Torah. 
and you take care of that animal, even if it's hours, days, weeks, years. But if that neighbor is like, I'm here for Cujo, you can't hide Cujo. You got to give Cujo. I don't know why I keep saying Cujo. Um, Lassie. Here's Lassie. Lassie's been fed, been watered, and uh, is happy. Take Lassie back. And here in Deuteronomy 22.3, it, it pretty much says, well, this goes for all of his stuff. And in like manner, you should do with his ass, you should do with his raiment, and with all lost things of your brothers, which he has lost and you have found, and you shall do likewise, you may not hide yourself. Anything. Stuff. You you, you find a, a, you know, it's, it's just like um, you're in a store and you find a ring on the floor. You're not like, oh, sweet. I'm going to go sell this thing at the pawn shop. No. Pick it up. And take it to the manager and be like, hey, somebody dropped this. Somebody's probably going to come back looking for this. And you never know. They probably will. It's a little harder when you find something like laying in the middle of the street. You're like, okay, where does this go? But use your best judgment. When something is lost, do the best you can to return it back to its owner. That is keeping Torah. That is part of Torah. Right? Because otherwise, if you're like, ah, pocket, that's stealing. That's theft. That's breaking the Eighth Commandment. You shall not see your brother's axe, ass or his ox fall down by the way and hide yourself from them. You shall surely help him lift them up again. It's kind of the same thought process of everything we're just saying. So I don't have to keep, I don't have to repeat it myself, but it's just kind of the same mentality. You know, you can't like see something go wrong and be like, ah. The woman shall not wear that which pertains unto a man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto Yahuwah Elohaika. If cross-dressing is an abomination, what is trans everything? What's that? Double abomination? Triple? Whew. So, uh, verse 6. If a bird's nest chance to be before you in the way in any tree or on the ground, whether they be young ones or eggs, and the dam sitting upon the young or upon the eggs... You shall not take the dam with the young, but you shall in any wise let the dam go and take the young to you that it may be well with you that you may prolong your days. So it's kind of like that don't boil a kid in his mother's milk thing. Like, like hold your horses there, bucko. Um, you know, you don't, <laughs> like, you don't need to take the bird and its eggs. Just take the eggs, eat and it will be well with you. Verse 8. When you build a new house, then you shall make a battlement or a par parapet, parapet battlement for your roof that you bring not blood upon your house if any man fall from thence. So um, this is a parapet somewhere. So like, for example, this roof right here, If this is a parapet. This is kind of like here we go. This is a parapet wall. So this is like this is a roof. It's saying, hey, don't just have this a free standing thing so someone can just like trip and go, whoa, build this up. Right? Build it up. So that you bring out blood upon your house if any man fall from it. So, you know, I know most modern day construction, this, especially those of us in America, this is like not a thing. Uh, although, actually, uh, now that I think about it, where I grew up in Southern California, I grew up in a, uh, at least in my high school years, I grew, I lived in a town called La Quinta, um, and um, we lived up in the cove. Anyways, a lot of the houses were like, um, I don't want to say Santa Fe style, that's not the right word, um, Pueblo style? I don't know, but they had roofs, a lot of the roofs, you can go up on top and people had like decks and balconies up top. Um so I guess this would go for also like a deck or a balcony. You wouldn't want just like a deck where like, you know, you have people over and their, their kids just like walk off the side of it, you know. Uh, anyways, but yeah, in California, I remember that we had these roofs. And so, yeah, I, I'm sure, sorry, I'm sure pro across America there's some of these things here. So, but that's kind of standard building practices. And so that's Torah. But, you know, we can take this simple command here and kind of expand and be like, we can apply that to a lot of areas of life and how we can help protect others from accidental harm. 
I think that should be something that we should always think about wherever we're at, um, whether it be our home or like at fellowship or what, how can we make sure that people don't get hurt? Um, that's just a basic Torah principle. Again, this is basic stuff, but maybe for some of you, maybe, hey, I don't usually think like that. Maybe I should start thinking like that. Some of us are probably like, hey, I think like that all the time, Adam, so stop badgering me. I'm not badgering you. I'm just, uh, we're just going over the basics. Uh, verse 9, you shall not sow your vineyard with diverse seeds, lest the fruit of your seed which you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard be defiled. And this is an interesting one. Um, I think I got some, yeah. So there's something really, I think, plain about this. Now, I am a very amateur gardener, so I'm not hip with splicing and hybrids, and I don't really know how that works. I don't know if this is really, this is, again, this is where I'm like, hey, I'm not a teacher. I'm, I'm a student here. I, I want to learn myself. Some of you out there are probably way more advanced with me than um, seed and cultivation and, and hybridization and cross-pollination and all that kind of stuff. I'm not very familiar with that. Uh, I'm really not. But I think from a spiritual sense, uh, I think we have some interesting things to glean here. However, it is interesting here in Deuteronomy, it specifically is only saying about your vineyard. However, there is a, um, there is a Torah commandment for all sorts of seeds here in Leviticus 19:19, 19, 19, you shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your cattle gender with a diverse kind. You shall not sow your field with mingled seed, right? So what is that talking about here? This is where I'm opening it up to the comment section. Um, you know, what exactly is this talking about? So is this saying that like, let's say I'm, I'm planting corn, right? And I have uh, country gentlemen and well, I can't remember in sweet whatever. Um, do I not plant them next to each other? Is that going to be a problem? Um, does that create genetic problems w with the two species right next to each other? Is that what it's saying, or is it saying, hey, do a, a row of country gentlemen and then a row of super sweet white here? Um, I, I'm open. I'm totally open to, to learning more. Um, and then also it's saying, neither shall a garment mingled of linen and woolen come upon you. So it's talking about three things not to mix here. Uh, your animals, don't mix the, the, don't mix the kinds, seed, and your clothing. Interesting. But let's take it in a spiritual sense. So let's go back to, you shall not sow your vineyard with diverse seeds, lest the fruit of your seed which you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard be defiled. So here's something that we learn in Isaiah 5. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. So the the husbandman had planted and was expecting a certain fruit, but it brought forth wild fruit, fruit that he didn't really want. Um, we'll learn more about that when we learn about it. Actually, let's go straight to that here. Matthew thirteen twenty four through 30, another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Just like we saw in Isaiah 5, he sowed it with the choicest, uh, choicest vine. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. So this is now, instead of uh, a vineyard, it's, it's comparing a, a wheat field. His enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. And we can know a wheat uh, versus a tear. They look very similar and grow similar. But when the fruit grows and becomes ripened, the wheat bows its head down over, but the tares stick straight up, right? Kind of like kind of pride versus humble. So the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? From whence then has it the tares? And he said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servants said unto him, Will you then go that we, will you will you then that we go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say unto the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But the 
but gather the wheat into my barn. Um, and then, of course, uh, speaking of which, we as people, again, we're likened to trees, to, to an olive tree, to a fig tree, uh, to a vine. Uh, and speaking of the vine and having diverse seed, what kind of seed are we? John 15, 1 through 8, I am the true vine. So this is Messiah is the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. So Yahuwah, the father, is the gardener, and Messiah is the vine. Every branch in me, so we are the branches, the Nazarim, that's the Hebrew, Nazarim. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. Like, oh, this branch here, yep, you've been here for a while, you're not bearing fruit, snip, you're out. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it that I may bring forth more fruit. And again, very amateur uh, gardener myself, but I've noticed like the, like my, uh, I really enjoy my lima beans. I mean, how many lima beans you get from one lima bean plant is amazing. Anyways, but the more you pluck off the fruit, the more it keeps putting forth more buds and then more fruit comes. But if the fruit would just sit there stale and just wither and whatever. It's not going to keep doing it. So anyway, so and every branch that bears fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now are you clean through the word which I have spoken unto you? Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, the Nazarim. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Just kind of like what we saw in that parable of the wheat and tares. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Okay. So, did that really answer the question of what's really going on here? I think it's still up on the table, but I think, again, even with some of these basic precepts, we can learn spiritual matters, parables, if you will. All right, uh, verse 10, 22, 10. You shall not plow with an ox and an ass together. Ooh, this gets, this gets pretty deep, right? Um, so, I'm not an expert plower with oxes and, and asses and donkeys, However, um, just some basic research shows that an ox and an ass would plow with different strength and at different speeds. Um, so you may not have the, always the best results. When Messiah Yahushua called his disciples, he likened his journeys, his preaching the gospel as plowing in the field. Uh, and that's what he said, he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy uh, of uh, worthy of me or worthy of the kingdom, I think is what he said. But nevertheless, if we look at plowing as kingdom work, you can plow with an ox and you can plow with an ass. A donkey can also be used to bear the yoke to plow, but they may not be good suited together. That's why even in the book of Acts, you see these the apostles, they... They had, you know, they had arguments and contentions. They had to split up, but they were, they were both, they were all prosperous even when they split up, and they were actually even more prosperous when they split up, you know, because they weren't yoked together. One could have been likened to a, a, uh, an ox, and one could have been likened to a donkey. Uh, but nevertheless, when it comes to plowing for the kingdom, um, I think we should be circumspect of who we're yoked up with. You know. I think we should understand who's who and what's what, and we should work. To, and, and people should be able to work together well. Which I don't think a donkey and an ox would work together that together very well. Different strength, different speeds. Um, you might you might kind of get off course because if you're trying to plow a straight line, and you have the ox which may go faster or stronger, and the donkey you might have that line just go. Just something to think about. Also. Paul has something to say about this, 2 Corinthians 6.14, but be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion has light with darkness. So um, that's not saying you can't go preach the good news to unbelievers or sit down with an unbeliever like Messiah did, right? 
sat down with the tax collectors and the harlots and the publicans to share the good news. But when it comes to yoking together, you don't want to yoke yourself together with um, darkness or um, an unbeliever. How can you do kingdom work? How can you do ministry work with you know uh, an unbeliever? So just some things to consider. Not that you probably would consider that anyways, but uh, 2211, you shall not wear a garment of diver diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. Now, this can get really tricky um, because some people would take this and say, well, you can't wear linen, and you can't wear like like a linen pants and a cotton shirt. It's not really what Torah says. Um, you know, and, and the reason is what's interesting about specifically not mixing wool and linen together is... I'll try to remember to leave this link here. But there's a study done. And I'll just go through it really quickly. Uh, long story short, um, we all have a base frequency of 100. Organic cotton is the same, 100, a frequency of 100. Um, a diseased, nearly dead person has a frequency of about 15. And that's where polyester, rayon, and silk register. So when you wear polyester, it actually is taking energy from you. That's why you'll notice that like when you take stuff out of the dryer, it's usually your polyester clothes that are like clingy and staticky, right? Because it's it absorbs the energy. Um, however, if the fabric is higher frequency, it gives energy to the body. This is where linen comes in as a super fabric. Its frequency is 5,000. So... It give, helps bring in energy instead of take it away from you. Like like polyester clothes. I, I got rid of all my polyester clothes. I'm done. It's, it's out of here. It's out of here. I gave it all to goodwill. And that was, that was very freeing. Wool is also 5,000, but when mixed together with linen, the frequencies cancel each other out and fall to zero, which makes that garment, a garment of wool and linen mixed together, a zero, which is even worse than polyester. So... Uh, even wearing wool sweater on top of a linen outfit in a study collapsed the electrical field, right? So this is just uh, this is just a, a scientific experiment that coincides with what the Torah says. So personally, I, I don't think um, what the scripture is saying, and I could be wrong. It's not saying you can't wear like um, you know cotton jeans and you know a polyester shirt. It's not saying that. But I would not mix wool and linen together, I think, for your own health. Just like I wouldn't eat pork because it's – well, first, it's, it's I'm not likening pork to, to mixing wool and linen. I'm just saying Yah knows what's good for our bodies and what's not. And it looks like if you do wool and linen together, it's even worse than than, poly, uh, than polyester or rayon or any of these, any of these man-made fabrics that take energy away. But this would do it even worse. Look into it, though. Look into linen. Um, I thoroughly enjoy wearing linen. I've got a few uh, outfits of linen. I'm actually I'm wearing linen. This is a linen shirt, and i got some linen pants on right now. Um, it's maybe all in my mind, but I, I, feel, I feel great when I wear linen. I find it very comfortable. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to say, but look into it yourself. And you can find deals on linen. Um, I'm an eBay kind of guy. I find uh, like used clothing, used linen and clothing, uh, or like you know stuff that's got like a nick or in it or whatever. You can find some really good deals that way. Uh, some people do it in uh, like thrift stores. They don't like really care linen or cotton. They're like whatever. It's a shirt. Um, a lot of people find some really inexpensive linen that way, but you you can find it out there. Okay, so verse twelve: You shall make fringes. Upon the four quarters of your vesture, wherewith you cover yourself, zitzit. We've talked a lot about zitzit. Um, if you're not wearing zitzit, I would highly recommend you read um, chapter uh, Numbers chapter 15. Um, a lot of us have found a blessing in it, so consider it. Let's just read Numbers 15. And Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make fringes in the borders of their garments. I don't know if you can see that. Throughout, the, throughout their generations, just like we read the Sabbath, throughout your generations, that they put upon the fringe of the borders a riband of blue, and it shall be unto you a fringe, that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of Yahuwah, and do them, and that you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you used to go a-whoring, 
that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto Yahweh Elohim. It's not a bad thing. This is a good thing. This should remind us not to go ever go back to our old ways. To remind us of the commandments. And it's blue, right? Blue because the tablets of the of the uh, commandments were actually blue. It's not, not like this, what, what we were used to thinking. But they were like they were like blue, sapphire blue. So, I mean, these are more like navy blue, but it's blue. Um. So what's it? What is interesting? Uh, actually, we're almost done. We'll we'll read the um, the targums here in a second. Uh, verse thirteen: If any man take a woman and go in, go in unto her and hate her and give occasions of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman and when I came to her I found her not a maid, then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city and the gate, and the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to be his woman and he hates her, and lo he has given occasions of speech against her saying, I found not your daughter a made and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity and they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city uh, if you've got young children with you uh, you're the parents you may or may not want them to hear this so I'll give you a few seconds to have them leave the room for just a second or cover their ears or whatnot. so because um, this sounds pretty wild you're like what, what's this cloth of virginity uh, so back in the day what they do because this is a huge deal to, to marry a, a virgin um, and if a woman wasn't a virgin, this is, this is really bad news. So marriage ceremony, marriage consummation in the marriage bed, they lay down a cloth. And I think all of us adults know at this point, when a man goes into a woman, that's a virgin, there's a little bit of blood. Well, that cloth would be underneath her and it would catch, uh, that stuff. And, uh, that cloth would go to the parents of the wa- the woman, of the woman to be a token that she was or a sign or a symbol that she was, or proof, if you will, uh, that she was given as a virgin. Um, so you can bring the children back in. Verse 18, And the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him. So if the if the parents brought brought the proof, so the guy, if the man was like, hey, your accusation, she wasn't, she wasn't a virgin. And the parents were like, uh, yes, she was. Here's the stuff. The elders of that city shall take the man and chastise him. And they shall immerse him in a hundred shekels of silver and give them unto the father of the damsel because he has brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Yasharel, and she shall be his woman and may not put her away all his days. But if this thing is true and the tokens of her virginity not be found for the damsel, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die because she has wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So shall you put the evil from among you put away the evil from among you let's pause there real quick because i actually forgot an important part earlier uh when we were talking about the stoning of the uh, rebellious child um so we as parents need to be diligent we learned it in actually uh in deuteronomy 6 where it's like it's not just about us keeping these commandments but it's teaching them to our children diligently also in deuteronomy 30 uh, which is coming up soon, that we learned that it's only when we come back and our children with all of our heart to his Torah that then he's going to come back and gather us. So we need to train our children up with diligence. Proverbs twenty three thirteen through 14, withhold not correction from the child, for if you beat him with the rod, he shall not die. And that's, that goes against what's taught in this world, right? Oh, don't be, don't, you know, don't spank your children. Just, you know, this and that. And of course we see the fruits of that. And I'm not sitting here encouraging you to just beat your children silly that's not what i'm talking about but if they get out of line a little correction on the behind yes yes it says i mean this is this is your bible right here withhold not correction from the child for if you beat him with a rod he shall not die right so if you spank him it's not gonna he's not gonna die you shall beat him with a rod and shall deliver his soul from hell i'm sorry this this world teaches us you know it fl- inverts uh, good and evil, good for evil, evil, you know, good is evil and evil is good. We're supposed to spank our children if they're out of line. Some of you have children that don't need to be spanked. Praise Yah. I can tell you, I know I've got five children and they're different. 
I can tell you I've got one that needs spankings. And like the other four, uh, and like three of the others barely ever need it. But one gets out of line. And one needs it. And others learn, you know, through other things like loss of things, like um, loss of a toy or something, whatever, you know. Um, any case, so we need to correct our children. If your child's out of line, consider what the book of Proverbs says. Proverbs thirteen twenty four: he that spares his rod hates his son. This rod is a rod of correction. He that spares the rod hates his son, but he that loves him chastens him betimes. Betimes means diligently. Proverbs twenty two fifteen: foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Proverbs 20, 29, 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. In any case, that's uh, it's almost stay on topic. So, all right. I know that was kind of a little backpedaling there from, or not backpedaling, but kind of going back to where we were before. But I, I realized I just skipped that part and it was really important to talk about, talking about the rebellious child and um, correction. All right, first... Uh, Deuteronomy 22, 22. If a, man, man, if a man be found lying with a woman, married to a man, then they shall both of them die. Both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shall you put away the evil from Israel. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto a man, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city. And this is what I was talking about with the Messiah. They're supposed to both be, they're both supposed to be brought out. And remember, uh, with the adulterous woman, only she was brought out to Yahusha. And ye shall stone them with stones that they die, the damsel because she cried not, being in the city, and the man because he has humbled his neighbor's woman, so shall you put away evil from among you. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel you shall do nothing to her, nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man rises against his neighbor and slays him, even so is this matter. So this is basically saying rape is equal to murder. For he found her in the field, and betrothed, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin which is not betrothed, and lay a hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found... Then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he has humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. So this is basically saying, um, and this is rampant in this country, in our, in our generation, um, premarital, pre, premarital relations, fornication, you've got to marry each other. And it says he can't divorce her all his days. That's Torah. That's basically what it's saying. That's what it's saying. So, if you have premarital sex uh, relations, sorry, I know there's children, children that watches this. If you have pre premarital relations, and you can't get divorced, you have to get married, and you can't get divorced. Let that sink in with what's going on all over us. A man shall not take his father's woman, his wife nor discover his father's skirt. Right? Some of the stuff in the Torah is pretty simple. Pretty simple. Okay. Uh, there's something in the Targums I wanted to read also here. So, I wanted to read the second paragraph. Now, here's what's interesting. Neither fringed robes, so this is Zitzit, nor Tefillin, which are the ornaments of a man, shall be upon a woman. So this is where I'm saying that I don't, I'm not saying the Targums has this completely right and, and trumps everything that we read in other versions. But um, according to this, Zitzit are not for women. That's what it's saying. But I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I really don't. Um, I'm not, and I'm not going to sit here and just say that I'm right just because of my thought process. But um, you know, we do see that. Paul was saying in Galatians, there's neither male nor female, for we're all, you know, bond nor free, we're all one in Messiah Yahusha. So I wouldn't say that we should, we could forbid a woman from wearing a seat if she wants to, uh, to help remind her of the commandments and walking in the way. I, I just can't see that. So again, I don't agree with everything that's written in these Targums, um, 
but I just wanted to read it for reference. Now, here's what's also interesting. Neither shall a man shave himself so as to appear like a woman, for everyone who does so is an abomination before Yahweh, your Elohim. So this is saying if a man has a clean-shaven face to appear like a woman, that that's an abomination. Now, again, we don't see that clearly in uh, the version we all grew up with, with the KJV and and uh, the Masoretic or even the Septuagint. We don't see this. Uh, but it is interesting. Now, it does give a little bit of light to um, this passage in Samuel, David, Beard. Yes, uh, 2 Samuel 10. 2 Samuel 10 to Samuel 10. Wherefore, Hanun took David's servants and shaved off the one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. And when they told it to David, he sent to meet them because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards are grown and then return. So it was like a shame, I guess, for a man to have a clean shaven face back then, at least in David's day. I'm not, and I'm not saying here that you have to have a beard or else. I'm not saying that. But it's just some things to, to consider, talk about, discuss, and you can take it to ya. Because like I said before, I ain't your daddy. Just your brother, and I care. Um, also, so that was the second. So let's look at the fourth. No. Okay. All right. We're good. Okay. So. Deuteronomy 23. He that is wounded in the stones or has his privy member cut off shall not enter into the assembly of Yahuwah. A bastard shall not enter into the assembly of Yahuwah. Even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the assembly of Yahuwah. An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the assembly of Yahuwah. Even to their tenth generation shall he not enter into the assembly of Yahuwah forever. Now, we did see, though, that in we did see that in the Book of Acts, it was clearly taught that um, in Peter's vision, which people use for food, it was really for people that um, don't call that which is common or unclean, uh, which has been cleansed. So we know now that any nation, tribe, tongue, race, race ethnicity. Uh, can come into the assembly of Yahuwah through faith and belief of Messiah, who should be washed by the blood of the Lamb, and to con continue in that faith by walking His commandments. Um, so we do see a little change there. It is also interesting. It says a Moabite shall not enter into the assembly of Yahuwah. What's well, interesting? Um, there's a book called Gad the Seer, which I do believe is a true book. It explains it because there's kind of there would be, seem to be what, what would be a contradiction because David's grandmother. Or great grandmother, grandmother Ruth, was a Moabite, right? Boaz, Ruth got together, um, and so anyway, is a great grandmother. It's maybe great grandmother. Any case, either way, uh, he's definitely less than ten generations removed from a Moabite, uh, and so this got brought up. So a Mo uh, in the in the story of in the the book of Gad the Seer, a Moabite comes up to David said he wants to enter the assembly. David's like, sorry. The Torah says you can't. And so the Moabite was like, hmm, isn't your grandma or great-grandmother um, Ruth, who was one of ours, and how are you able to enter? And David was like, good question. Let me take it to Yah. And so Yah answered, it's a Moabite man, not a Moabite woman. So, just a little uh, little information. So, If you were born at a fornication back then, you were not able to be entered into the assembly. Do I believe that someone that was born at a fornication can enter the assembly now who cleanses himself by the blood of the Lamb and walks in his truth with all his heart and soul and mind? Yeah, I do. So if you're out there and you're like, I wouldn't worry. All right, uh, twenty three four because they because uh, they met you not with bread and water in the way when you came forth out of Mitzrayim and because they hired against you Balaam the son of Beor of Pithor of Aram Naharaim to curse you. Nevertheless, Yahweh Lahaika would not hearken unto Balaam, but Yahweh Lahaika turned the curse into a blessing unto you because Yahweh Lahaika loved you. 
You shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all your days forever. You shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. You shall not abhor a Mitzri, uh, um, an Egyptian, because you are a stranger in his land. The children that are begotten of them shall enter into the assembly of Yahuwah in their third generation. So a little different, of course, a little different for that. Um, we do have something interesting to read there in the Targums. Uh, let's see, one, two, three. Oh, I didn't finish writing down which ones. Okay, so it does say here, You shall not abhor an Edomite when he comes to be a proselyte, for he is your brother, nor shall you abhor a Mitzrite, because you were dwellers in their land. The children who are born to them in the third generation shall be fit to take wives from the people of the congregation of Yahuwah. Also, actually, it does here say here, um, Yeah, it says, Neither an Ammonite nor a Moabite man is fit to take a wife from the congregation of Yahuwah's people, nor unto the tenth generation shall they take a wife from the congregation of the people of Yahuwah. So this kind of really actually does coincide with what the book of Gad says. Uh, all right, so verse 9, 23, 9, Deuteronomy 23, 9. When the host goes forth against your enemies, then guard you from every wicked thing. Now, Listen, we go to battle every day against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness. So um, we should guard us from every wicked thing every single day. She would not. If there be among you any man that is not clean by reason of, un of uncleanness that chances him by night, then shall he go abroad out of the camp. He shall not come within the camp. But it shall be when the evening comes on, he shall wash himself with water. And when the sun is down, he shall come into the camp again. So it's interesting that he's clean when the evening comes. Why? Because I think, in my opinion, it's because the next day starts. And I know some of you are like, oh, no, it's it's sunrise to sunrise. I get it. Um, if you want to know a little more why I'm there, uh, you can take a look at the homepage, the playlist. Uh, I think the calendar, I've got uh, morning to morning or evening to evening. Um, and there's a lot of these, like especially in Leviticus, someone is clean at evening. When the sun goes down, they're clean. Uh, in my opinion, it's not because, you know, in my opinion, it's because the next day starts, but that's for another time. Verse 12, You shall have a place also without the camp, whether you shall go forth abroad. And this is where you use the restroom. And you shall have a paddle upon your weapon, and it shall be when you should ease yourself abroad. You shall dig therewith, and shall turn back and cover that which comes forth from you. For Yahweh Lahaika walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you, and give up your enemies before you, Therefore, you sh your camp shall be holy, that he sees no unclean thing in you, and turn away from you. 15 through 16. You shall not deliver unto his master the servant which is escaped from his master unto you. He shall dwell with you, even among you, in that place which he shall choose in one of your gates, where it likes him best. You shall not oppress him. The Targums actually has something to say about this too. It actually reinforces this thought. You shall not deliver up a stranger into the hand of the worshiper of idols. The sojourner who has escaped to be among you shall be under the protection of my Shekinah, for therefore he has fled from his idolatry. Let him dwell with you and observe the commandments among you. Teach him the Torah and put him in the school in the place that he chooses in one of your cities. Employ him, employ him that he may do well and trouble him not by, whoops, trouble him not by words. So it kind of reinforces that it is saying to take in the escapee that's escaping from a pagan nation and wants to join himself unto your ways. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite in the sons of Israel. There's just no place for it. And, you know, modern-day Christianity that says the law is done away with, well, they cherry-pick. They'll they'll talk about you know homosexuality all day long and how it's a sin, but when it comes to the Sabbath or the feast days or or clean eating, ah, the law is, law is done away with. So they're partial in the law. There's a lot of uh, verses in the Torah about being partial in the law. Um, so you know I, I think this is going to play a huge thing in the days to come, uh, and it's going to be forced into the churches, and they're 
going to either have to give in or they're going to have some big problems. And I think they're eventually going to have to give in because if you follow their doctrine all the way through, you have to eventually allow it. You have to allow um, these kind of things. So that's why I like what we're doing. And it's black and white. It's either good or it's bad. I know. I know some of you are going to be upset with me about mentioning the polygyny thing at the beginning of this. You're like, oh, we're done with Adam. You know, he, sh- he, he should have he should have condemned it because it's so atrocious. Um, again, it's either sin or it's not. There's no, there's no, well, <clears throat> you're just born that way. No. 2318, you shall not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of Yahweh Elohika for any vow, for even both of these are an abomination unto Yahweh Elohika. You shall not lend upon usury to your brother, usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. This is interest. So if you lend somebody something, there's no interest. Don't do it. At least, you know, it says, you know, not to your brethren. It does here say, unto a stranger you may lend upon usury, uh, but unto your brother you shall not lend upon usury, that Yahweh Haika may bless you in all that you set your hand to in the land where you go to possess it. So we're not supposed to be like loan sharks here, okay? We're not supposed to charge interest uh, on, on sharing. Not sharing, but, you know, uh, lending. When you shall vow a vow unto Yahweh Haika, you shall not slack to pay it. For Yahweh Haika will surely require it of you, and it would be sin unto you. But if you shall forbear to vow... It shall be no sin unto you. Messiah repeated these words, right? He said, you know, um, swear not at all, right? That which has gone out of your lips, you shall guard and perform, even a freewill offering according as you have vowed unto Yahweh Lahaika, which you have promised with your mouth. And I think we should really, I think, and this is where I I can work on some things. Uh, I mean, even just the simplest things like, you know, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll call you tomorrow. And you don't call tomorrow. I'm, I'm guilty of that kind of stuff, right? So that which has gone out of your lips, you shall guard and perform. I, I got to work on this. And you can just be like, oh, yeah, well, I got busy. You know, okay. What does the Torah say? So I am, am standing guilty before you all of things like this. And it may seem small. I'm like, oh, well, it's just, I, I, I want to get to a point where we're walking in Torah. When you come into your neighbor's vineyard, then you may eat your grapes to your fill at your own pleasure, but you shall not put any in your vessel. When you come into the standing grain of your neighbor, then you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not move a sickle unto your neighbor's standing grain. We saw this with Messiah and the disciples, where they were walking the Sabbath day, and they were, they were hungry, so they plucked grains of, of ears of the corn, of um, the wheat, right? And the, the Pharisees were like, you're doing that which is not lawful. Messiah's like, well, let me tell you a thing or two. All right, so Deuteronomy 24. When a man has taken a woman and married her, and it come to pass that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a sephir of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she has departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if the latter man hate her and write her a sephir of divorcement and gives it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man die, which took her to be his woman, her former man, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his woman. After that, she is defiled, for that is an abomination before Yahuwah. And you shall not cause the land to sin, which Yahuwah Lahaika gives you for an inheritance. So, Matthew 19, uh, let's see. Yeah, the Pharisees came also unto him, tempting him, saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that which he made them at the beginning, made them male and female? And for this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore Elohim has joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then give a commandment of a writing of a divorcement to put her away? He says unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. 
And I say unto you, whatsoever, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, commits adultery. And whoso marries her which is put away does commit adultery. Now it's interesting, we, as a lot of us have been testing, in the Hebrew Gospels, we can't find this, where a woman's not allowed to go remarry that's put, put away. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save to whom it was given. Point being, uh, actually, um, you know, so I think Deuter uh, I think um, Deuteronomy makes it very clear that you can divorce your wife um, if he's found uncleanness in her. And let's look at this, actually. Uncleanness. Erba. Nakedness, nudity, shame, uh, pudena. I've never even heard that word, pudena, implying shameful exposure, nakedness of a thing, indecency, improper behavior, exposed, undefended. Um, so, I mean, it does kind of imply something, you know, in the sense of something sexually immoral. But nevertheless, you know, I think it got abused, and Messiah was like, listen, you guys are abusing divorce. You should be able to work it out, whatever it is. No divorce except for fornication itself. This same uncleanness, right? What's interesting is it says here that when a, when a wife has gone and been another man's, uh, another man's wife, that she can't return. We see here, though, in Jeremiah, they say, if a man, Jeremiah 3, if, if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again unto me, says Yahuwah. So even Yahuwah is like, my law, my Torah says, I can't take you back. But if you're willing to return and keep my ways, return to me and I'll take you back. Can we have that same compassion with um, a wife who committed adultery on you? Maybe we can. No, maybe that's just for Yah. I pray that none of you are in that situation. But if, that, if you are, take it to Yah in prayer, of course, and fasting. Deuteron Deuteronomy 24.5 When a man has taken a new woman, new wife, he shall not go out to war, neither shall he be charged with any business, but he shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up his wife, which he has taken. No, and that's why a lot of people say that, you know, when Messiah Yahushua comes and gathers his bride, that there's going to be no war for a year. Very possible. No man shall take the nether or the upper millstone of the pledge. And the millstone is how they ground their, their uh, you know, ground their uh, wheat or other grains into flour. There's two parts of it. So they use, you know, so you're saying you can't take either one. You can't take it for a pledge or for security, security for a debt, for he takes a man's life to pledge. It's because it's their daily bread. Every single day they ground, they, they ground flour and uh, baked bread every single day. If a man, man be found sealing any of his brethren of the children of Yisrael and makes merchandise of him or sells him, then that thief shall die and he shall put away evil from among you. Take heed in the plague of leprosy that you guard diligently and do according to all that the priests, the Levites, shall teach you as I commanded them. So shall you guard to do. Remember what Yahweh Lahaika did unto Miriam, by the way, after that you were come forth out of Mitzrayim. She gossiped and she got leprosy. When you lend your brother anything, you shall not go into his house to fetch his pledge. Right? You're not going to be like a loan shark, like breaking kneecaps. Like, hey, hey, where's my money? No, you shall stand abroad, stand outside, be patient, and the man whom you lend shall bring out the pledge abroad to you. And if a man be poor, you shall not sleep with his pledge. In any case, you shall deliver him the pledge again when the sun goes down, that he may sleep in his own raiment and bless you, and it shall be righteousness unto you before Yahweh You shall not oppress a hired servant. 
that is poor and needy, whether he be of your brethren or of your strangers that are in your land within your gates. At his day you shall give him his hire, neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor and sets his heart upon it, lest he cry against you unto Yahuwah, and it be sent unto you. Right? So just like the um, like we were saying before, when the sun goes down, it's the next day happens. So it says you're supposed to pay him that day, right? This same day you shall give him his hire, neither let the sun go down upon it. Pay him that day. So it's something to consider, those of us that are hiring each other for work, maybe we should be paying each other on a daily basis. We know that, of course, in this world, it's you know weekly pay, bi-weekly pay, monthly pay, but it, it was used to be not so back in the day. Daily pay, daily wages, daily bread, daily wages. Um, Amos 2, 6, 3, Thus says Yahuwah, For three transgressions of Israel, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteous for silver, and the poor for a pair of shoes, that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor, and turn aside the way of the meek. And a man and his father will go into the same maid to profane my holy name. And they lay themselves down upon the clothes laid to pledge by every altar, and they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Right? Job 22, 6, For you have taken a pledge from thy brother for naught, and stripped the naked of their clothing. Right? Just being harsh to the poor. If you have nothing to pay, why should you take away the bed from under thee? Why should he take away the bed from under thee? Proverbs 22, 22 27. There's a lot more. Actually, in the book of Sirach, there's a ton about taking care of the poor. Um, we really, really need to pity the poor, brothers and sisters, especially of our own. 2 Esdras 2, 20 through 23. Guard the rights of the widow, secure justice for the fatherless, give to the needy, defend the orphan, clothe the naked, care for the injured and the weak. Do not ridicule a lame man, protect the maimed, and let the blind man have a vision of my splendor. We should be taking care of the weak, those that are feeble among us, those that need the most care. We should be most diligent to take care of. Um, this is Torah. This is totally Torah. Protect the old and the young within your walls, right? Both the old and the young are more frail than uh, your middle-aged or, or um, you know, full-strength individuals. When you find any who are dead, commit them to the grave and mark it, and I will give you the first place in my resurrection. Brothers and sisters, we have got to take care of those that are not as fortunate or those that are not as strong. Verse uh, 24, 16. The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Actually, um, I do want to find those verses real quick in Sirach. Give me just a moment. Um, yeah, this is what I thought. Okay, chapter 4. All right. Sirach 4, also known as Ecclesiasticus, My son, deprive not the poor of his living, and do not keep needy eyes waiting. Do not grieve the one who is hungry, nor anger a man in want. Do not add to the troubles of an angry mind, nor delay your gift to a beggar. Do not reject an afflicted suppliant, nor turn your face away from the poor. Do not avert your eye from the needy. Just like we were saying earlier, don't avert your eye from your neighbor's animal getting out, right? Don't look at the poor man and be like, oh, I didn't see you. Nor give a man occasion to curse you, for in the bitterness of soul he calls down a curse upon you. His creator will hear his prayer. Make yourself beloved in the congregation. Bow your head low to a great man. Incline your ear to the poor and answer him peaceably and gently. Right? Don't be giving money like, oh, here you go. Like, hey, how are you? Deliver him who is wrong from the hand of the wrongdoer, and do not be faint-hearted in judging a case. Be like a father to orphans, and instead of a husband to their mothers, then you will be likened to a son of the Most High, and he will love you more than does your mother. Big stuff, brothers and sisters. This is big boy and big girl stuff here. You shall not, uh, 2417, you shall not pervert the judgment of the stranger, nor the fatherless, nor take a widow's raiment to pledge. But you shall remember that you were bondmen in Mitzrayim, and Yahweh Lahaika redeemed you thence. Therefore I commanded you to do this thing. When you cut down your harvest in your field and have forgot a sheaf in the field, 
you shall not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, for the widow, that Yahweh Lahaika may bless you in all the work of your hands. This is, uh, the, if you want to learn an awesome story about this, the, the book of Ruth. It's all centered around this, about widow, poor, gleanings of the uh, the harvest, um, and Boaz having pity on Ruth. It's a good book. When you beat your olive tree, you shall not go over the boughs again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your, vine your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterwards. So basically, what gleaning means is they go in and harvest, and usually there's some leftover. Um, uh, going back to my lima bean plant, my, me and my children, we go and we, we gather everything. Guess what? If you look hard enough, you left some stuff. That's because there's that one hiding behind that one leaf, and it's like, uh, uh. Same thing with the, the grapes, the olive, the olive tree. There will always be some left, right? So go in and reap it, and then left you know, for the stranger, for the fatherless, for the poor. It's a little harder for us in this day and age. Um, it doesn't really work like that anymore. But certainly you can have a main harvest of your crops, and maybe you can give some of the excess to the poor, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, the orphan. I don't know, just some things to consider. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And she, oh, I already read this, didn't I? And you shall remember that you were a bondman in the land of Mitzrayim. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. All right, Deuteronomy 25. If there be a controversy between men, and they come unto judgment, that the judges may judge him, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. Right? We can't have favor based off someone's social status or the way they look or whatever. You can't do it. There's one person's right, one person's wrong. That's how it, that's how it has to be. Or you may find out they're both wrong, right? I'm just saying that, like, you can't give favor, um, just, you know, of preference or anything. And it shall be, if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten, that the judges shall cause him to lie down and to be beaten before his face according to his fault by a certain number. Forty stripes he may give him, and not exceed, lest if he should exceed and beat him above these with many stripes, then your brother should seem vile unto you. You shall not muzzle the ox when he treads out the grain. Paul likened this to someone who's, again, uh, you know, the treading out the grain or plowing the field, working in the kingdom, that makes sure that he's taken care of at all times. Just like uh, we talked about, like the Levites, the the priests, the high priests. They were taken care of, of all their necessities of life by the children of Israel so they can continue in the work of Elohim. Back then it was the sacrifices, but they also taught the Torah, um, um, performed many different um, different things according to the, to the Torah. Um, but so, you know, again, I've said it before, I don't think it's a wrong thing for pastors in a church to live by tithes. However, it's hypocritical because they'll go off of the old Levitical tithe law, but the rest of the law is apparently done away with. That's why it's hypocritical. Verse 5, 25, 5. If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the woman of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her man's brother shall go in unto her and take her to be his woman, and perform the duty of a man's brother unto her. And it shall be that if the firstborn which she bears shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Yashrael. So I am not trying to beat this polygyny thing to a dead horse, but here's a scenario. So let's say, let's say I've got a brother, and he's got a wife, and I've got a wife. And he dies and his wife was childless I would have to by the Torah I would have to take that woman as my wife as a second wife it doesn't say if a man is single can he only take this woman it doesn't say that just think about it for a second and I'm not promoting polygyny I'm really not I really am not I am not a big fan of it personally and I've seen it, and there's, there's even today, polygynous relationships have major issues, at least the ones I've seen. Maybe some of you out there are like, hey, we're doing it great. Hey, fine, good on you. I'm not a fan, but we're here to call something a sin or it's not a sin. 
And all I'm saying is it's not a sin. The world calls it a sin. But the, the Bible, your, your Bible does not. And if the man like not to take his brother's woman, then let his brother's woman go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My man's brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Yashorel. He will not perform the duty of my man's brother. Then the elders of a city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's woman come up unto him to the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, So shall it be done unto the man that will not build up his brother's house. And the, na the name of, and his name shall be called in Yashrael, the house of him that has his shoe loosed or unshod, the, the man of the house who is unshod. Pretty random, right? It comes from the Testament of Zebulun, chapter 1, 7 through 23. This is talking about the, the oppression of Joseph and selling him and all that kind of stuff. This is Zebulun speaking, but I wept in, many, in secret many days on account of Joseph, for I feared my brethren, because they had all agreed that if any one should declare the secret, he should be slain. But when they wished to kill him, I adjured them with much tears not to be guilty of the sin. For Simeon and Gad came against Joseph to kill him, and he said unto them with tears, Pity me, my brethren, have mercy upon the bowels of Jacob our father. Lay not upon me your hands to shed innocent blood, for I have not sinned against you. And if indeed I have sinned with chastening, chastise me, my brethren, but lay not upon me your hand for the sake of Jacob our father. And as he spoke these words, wailing as he did so, I was unable to bear his lamentations and began to weep, and my liver was poured out, and all the substance of my bowels was loosened. And I wept with Yosef, and my heart sounded, and the joints of my body trembled, and I was not able to stand. And when Yosef saw me weeping with him, and them coming against him to slay him, he fled behind me, beseeching them. But meanwhile Reuben arose and said, Come, my brethren, let us not slay him, but let us cast him into one of these dry pits, which our father digged and found no water. For this cause Yahweh forbade that the water should rise up in them in order that Yosef should be preserved. And they did so until they sold him into the Ishmaelites. For in his price I had no share. Right. So here's where we're getting into this. For in his price I had no share, my children, but Simeon, and Gad and six other of our brethren took the price of Yosef and bought sandals for themselves and their wives and their children, saying, We will not eat of it, for it is the price of our brother's blood, but we shall assuredly tread it underfoot, because he, because he said that he would be king over us, and so let us see what will become of his dreams. Therefore, so because of this, so because of the price of Yosef, their brothers, and because of buying these sandals with them and treading underfoot his price, Therefore it is written in the writing of the law of Moses that whosoever will not raise up seed to his brother, his sandals shall be unloosed, and they shall spit in his face. And the brethren of Yosef wished not that their brother should live, and Yahweh loosed them from their sandals, which they wore against Yosef their brother. For when they came into Egypt, they were unloosed by the servants of Joseph outside the gate, and so made they obeisance to Yosef after the fashion of King Pharaoh. And not only did they make obeisance to him, but were spit upon also, falling down before him forthwith. And so they were put to shame before the Egyptians. So that is apparently the origin of that. Makes sense to me. All right, we're going to finish up here. Um, verse 11, when men strive together one with another and the, one, and the wife of the one draws near for to deliver her man out of the hand of him that smites him and puts forth her hand and takes him by the secret, so the secret parts... Then you shall cut off her hand, and your eye shall not pity her. Ouch. That's a rough one. You shall not have in your bag diverse weights, great and small. You shall not have in your house diverse measures, great and small. But you shall have a perfect and a just weight, a perfect and a just measure shall you have, that your days may be lengthened in the land which Yahweh Haika gives you. So in our transactions, and our dealings with each other, it should be fair and balanced and and not not uh, not falsified. Um, you shouldn't hide things. Like uh, if you're like selling a car, you shouldn't falsify certain things that may be wrong with it. Or that would be to me that would be a modern day likeness to a false weight, false measures, false balances. Um, I think everything in a business transaction should be um, it should be fair. Everything should be known. Everything should be on the table. Um, things shouldn't be hidden or kept secret. I think that's a, a, a good way to look at 
today. And, and you can take that and, and, and think more of it for yourself or what you do on a daily basis or, or whatnot. Uh, but just something to consider because we don't sit in there and weigh stuff out usually anymore. Uh, everything's all electronic and it's all, you know, whatever. But for all that do such things, right, so falsify these transactions and do unrighteously are an abomination unto Yahweh Lahaika. Remember what Amalek did unto you by the way when you were come forth out of Mitzrayim, how he met you by the way and smote the hindmost of you, even all that were feeble behind you, when you were fa uh, faint and weary and he feared not Elohim. So how we're supposed to protect the feeble, the weak, um, the injured, the maimed, the blind. Amalek came behind the camp and, you know, smote all the feeble. Therefore, it should be written when Yahuwah has given you rest from all your enemies round about in the land which Yahuwah gives you for an inheritance to possess it, that you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget it. So, with that, brothers and sisters, uh, that will conclude our Torah portion today. A little longer than normal. We have a lot of interesting meat to cover here. I really hope I didn't offend you with some of the harder topics that we have to talk about, but you know, again, I'm here to either stand for Torah or not. And I'm here to stand for Torah. And I know when I do that, that Yah will guide us. Yah will protect us. So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Yahweh, we come before you. We bless you again. And thank you for, for allowing us to study together, Father, whether uh, whether they're together with us live or watching as a video later on. Father, I pray that you would continue to open our eyes and our ears that we may be uh, able to see the wondrous matters written in your Torah. Bless us, Father, with understanding, for we know that true understanding and wisdom comes from you and, and comes from you alone, Father. We just ask that you'd give us wisdom and give it to us liberally, as the book of James, Jacob says, Father. We thank you for for your son, Messiah, Husha, for forgiveness and reconciliation. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your righteous Torah that we may know what is good and what is evil. We may know what, what is to be done, what's right in your sight and what is not, Father. And we just continue to ask you to give us understanding. And we bless you for your Shabbat and for all your appointments, Father. We love you in Yahushua's name. Hallelujah and Amen. Interesting thought that came across my mind the other day. Um, Shabbat days, New Moon days, and the Seven Feast days, these are appointments of Yah. So, if you take the 52 weekly Shabbats, the seven feast days, and the 11 new moons, because you, if you said 12, one of those new moons is a feast day. It equals 70. 70 appointments per week, or per year. Pretty cool, right? Anyways, with that, brothers and sisters, let's, we're going to do the priestly blessing, and um, yeah, maybe we'll do the new song. No, that one's not ready yet. We'll do the priestly blessing, and... Let's see, what do any of these songs relate to today's study? We'll find out. Upon you, 
his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you, Yahuwah. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you Let's sing a little song about the two greatest commandments, loving Yahuwah and loving people. Let's start with how we love Him. You shall not have any other about loving other people. Here's how. And you shall not murder anyone even in your heart. Love everyone and you shall not commit adultery even in your mind. Put that all behind and you shall not Steal anything, be satisfied with what you provides, and you shall not tell any lies, for he sees all who's above the skies. You shall not covet anything but keep his ways. You won't lack a thing, keeping his commandment shows you love. Yahusha did not abolish but strengthen. 